Welcome back to the show where we run you through all the Dolphins news you need to know about. On today's episode, again, we're in the dead spot of the year. That's going to be a lot of unnecessary speculation. Um, you know, speculation over linebackers really is what we're going to talk about. Um, there have been a few that the Dolphins have been connected to that are really interesting names. And then we have other players like Nate Orchard, who we're going to talk about here in a second, who actually signed with the Miami Dolphins. So we have some stuff to talk about, but again, it's not a lot. So this might be a shorter episode. But if you like that, stick around. In case you don't know the linebackers that are connected to the Dolphins. And we need edge help really bad. So this first news story comes from Pro Football Rumors, where this show gets all of its news. It's a beautiful... If you don't... And I'm not... have any. I have nothing to do with it. Obviously. This is a... You know, you know, I don't even have to say anything else. But this is a... If, if you don't know what Pro Football Rumors is, you should. Uh, this first news story, Dolphin sign Nate Orchard. The Dolphin signed edge rusher Nate Orchard, according to Sirius XM Radio. Barry Jackson and Miami Herald for, first reported that a deal was close to being done Wednesday night. He is 26 years old. He started 11 games uh, throughout his career. He's bounced around the league. Um, you know, he, yeah, he's obviously that Neville Hewitt type of a uh, player, I would say, is his caliber of... Um, talent levels, uh, but there is he. You know he's shown some promise over his um, career. I think last year, uh, Pro Football Focus ranked him the 68th edge defenders among 123 qualifiers. That's not bad um, for the caliber of player that he is. And he didn't have a lot of snaps. He only played 40% of the Cleveland Brown snaps last um, last season. And I don't think he finished the year with them, so that's pretty impressive. He only put he didn't even play half of the snaps. He graded out as the 68th best edge rusher with that many um, that percentage of the snaps. That's not terrible. When you look at his career numbers, um, as I'm pulling that up right now, you know he's he's a solid player. And we and to be honest with you, I feel like the best chance we have in terms of having any edge presence. Um, is just going to be having a healthy rotation and a lot of depth because there's not a lot of um, great t- different unless there's someone on the roster that you know turns out to be that way, uh, like the outside linebacker we drafted from Wisconsin. I can never pronounce his name right. I think it's Van Winkle. I think it is. Uh, but yeah, other than if that happens, so he had three sacks as an eight orchard. He had three sacks in 2015. 0 in 2016, 2 in 2017, 0 in 2018. But again, that's not bad, you know, him grading out there, grading out like that. With that unlimited amount of snaps, it's not terrible. <clears throat> I think it's a good signing. And like I just said, if anything, I think, unless Charles Harris, I think Charles Harris is probably the only one. The only reason I say the, hopefully Charles Harris is a good pass rusher. I don't even need him to be a good edge player, necessarily. As long as he's a good situational pass rusher, I think the team, I think that's great. If we could just find someone to set the edge, um, hopefully the um, undrafted, I can't, his name is escaping me, free agent that we got uh, got from, I think it was what, his, he played for New Mexico, um, which is, excuse me, all he did in college was set the edge. He, he had like, what, 10 plus tackles for loss uh, all of his years in college. Uh, the only reason he wasn't drafted is because he had a really bad... I mean, he was very slow. He's not the most athletic guy in the world. And obviously, it's a passing league now, so you have to have someone who can cover at times. But we just need someone to come in on first and second down. Situational football, multiple fronts. Um, you know, we really don't know who you're playing from week-to-week basis. you got to be versatile. And to have as many guys that could do something great on your team is, is a plus. Like I said, I think the best thing this team can do right now is just get a lot of different guys who can do a lot of different things individually and just switch them in and out uh, in different packages because we just don't have a proven starter right now on the roster that can be that edge guy. Uh, Charles Harris, again, is the the only hope that he can be a Pro Bowl caliber player. He has it in him. He just needs to be a better run defender. I don't think it's going to happen. So I think our safest bet 
really what we can hope for is him to be a, a, a very good pass rusher and him come on on third downs and give us something off the edge because he's not going to be someone, especially in our division, I think we're going to see a lot of run. Uh, maybe the Jets are going to be interesting because we know how Adam Gase calls plays. He's not he's not the most committed uh, play caller in the world. Um, so that's going to be interesting. But, all, you know, the Patriots, they're a run-heavy team, and so is the, um, the Buffalo Bills. So we have to have someone who can set the edge. Um, and, again, I think the best shot we have is just getting a lot of different players in, in, in the rotation. I think we're going to end up carrying a lot of linebackers. Um, but we'll see. And I think Nate Orchard adds to that. Hopefully he can come in and set the edge. He, again, 68 out of 130-plus guys who qualify for pro football uh, focus and only play 40% of the snaps is pretty good. So I think he adds depth. Hopefully he's someone who can help us set the edge um, and come in and be a good player for us. Because, we, again, we just don't have anybody right now. Um, this next news story comes from pro football rumors again. The Dolphins uh, have met with Connor Barwin. Veteran defensive end slash outside linebacker Connor B- Connor Bar I don't know why I'm messing up his name Connor Barwin will visit the Dolphins on Wednesday according to Adam uh, of ESPN.com Adam Schefter I think or yeah I think so this marks Barwin's first known uh, interest since his official release from the Giants in February. Connor is 32 years old. He'll be 33 in October. He appeared in 15 games but started just three, and he had just one sack to his credit in 2018. Um, again, if you don't know who Connor Barlin is, he has 56 career sacks. He was a really good player for the Philadelphia Eagles. He, he's had a very good NFL career, very productive. He's had double-digit sack seasons. Um, I think mostly for the Texans, actually. I would have to look that up. But uh, he's had a great career. And uh, he can be, he can definitely help us in the running game. He's a physical guy, um, and I think he's a great rotational player. He had, he's a vet. We don't have we have a lot of young guys and, and a lot of people who haven't started a lot of games on a consistent basis and don't have that kind of experience doing that. So I think he helps us that in that department. Um, I I hope the Dolphins get him because I, again I think he greatly improves the rotation. He's not someone who's going to come in and be when he once was, which is a pretty dominant edge guy but i think he can give us some good minutes when he you know in and out of the lineup and he and he's a good you know uh again he brings a lot of experience too so i think i mean i think he would be a great signing and again he adds to the rotation he is someone who can come in and and, and give us an edge presence for sure it's similar to what Chris Long did for the Patriots. Like, he is that kind of a player. Even though Chris Long... I mean, Chris Long looked like he was done. And then he did more of a... Instead of being a full-time edge guy, who was a dominant edge defender for a while, he became a very good rotational player. And we're not asking Connor Barwin... Again, he's not going to take a lot of snaps. He might take five a game. Or, you know, or ten a game. Just come in on certain downs where we need a physical guy on the edge who can help us stop the run... I feel like he can do that. Um, let's see here. His stat. So yeah, I forgot. I kind of nailed it. I think. Oh, he only had. Well, he's had two double digit sack seasons with the Texans and Eagles. He's always been a good um, tackler throughout his career. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. I'm trying to see if his TFLs here. All right, it doesn't matter. I. I mean, I've seen this. Uh, play throughout my life so he's a good player and i feel like he can again he's just he improves the rotation he improves the rotation this next new story is about another edge defender um which is the topic of this this particular episode because it's very important that we find someone who can do this uh obviously i think the offensive line is more of a mystery these both i think are equal actually it's gonna be really interesting to see because if we can this defense if we can find again, I think it's I think it's going to be a team effort. If we can find one who can be, uh, you know, not necessarily. We don't necessarily have to have a three down guy. And I forget, you know, you forget about Jerome Baker, um, as well. Like, I don't I just don't know if he can be an outside linebacker. You know, I think he can be a good three four. I don't think you know people bring up you have to be a physical. I mean, look at Bobby Wagner. Everybody said he was too small and all this other stuff. Like Jerome's is just as big. He might even be as like thick or strong. Like he doesn't look as big, but I th- I feel like Jerome could do it just fine. If Mark Barron can do it, then Jerome Baker can do it. Um, so I think 
this, it's just gonna be interesting to see how this front looks. Um, again, I think it's gonna have to be a team effort with just a bunch of guys in the rotation, but on the edges. But this next news story comes from Dolphins Wire. This was two weeks ago. This is old news, but I don't think we talked about it. And there has been, this is the last time uh, we're going to be talking about Nick Perry. This is the last report that Nick Perry has been, even been connected to a team. I think he was connected to Seattle before this. Um, so this is really interesting stuff here. Miami reportedly interested in pass rusher Nick Perry. Uh, this comes from Dolphins Wire. The Miami Dolphins' pass rush problems aren't going away anytime soon. Uh, let's see here. The team currently. The team's current projected starters at defensive end are Jonathan Woodard and Charles Harris. The two have combined for four career sacks, meaning the Dolphins are dangerously thin and outside pass rush. We know this. Um, and Nick Perry has been a very good player. He had 11 sacks in 2016. Uh, he had a, he's, since then, he's been just destroyed with injuries. Uh, but he's a very good player. The Packers extended him and gave him a lot of money for re- If it wasn't for injuries, who knows what you know? Nick Perry... Added, again, in 2016, considered one of the best edge defenders in the league. Then injuries hit, and now he is he finds himself in the place that he is. So this could be a very, very a very good sign. Not only does he he's a really good run defender, he's a very physical player. Um, he's a very good pass rusher. He adds a v- physical presence that this team needs. He can be a three down guy. He also can play four three D end if you need him to. He's big enough to do it. So he fits the multiple front scheme. Um, he he's a great again. He's a really good three four outside linebacker um, who can add pass rush, and he's a proven pass rusher in this league. If it wasn't, I mean, injuries really have have, have hurt his career. So it's interesting stuff, man. It's interesting stuff. I don't know what the front's gonna look like, but if Nick Perry, Connor Barwin, if any of this stuff happens, it's gonna improve the football team. Um, so I'm very excited to see i'm very excited to see how this team regardless of how we play it's gonna be interesting to see how brian flores especially since he's a defensive minded coach what does this front look like how creative is he gonna be um what is the rotation gonna look like how often are we gonna be in a 4-3 um how often are we gonna be a nickel like all that stuff it's gonna be very interesting because he how he utilizes the current personnel on the team especially since there's a lot of young players um, we talk about Jerome Baker, Raekwon McMillan, how they fit into it, Kiko Alonso, how if all the, because you can't have two, uh, I mean, basically all three of those guys are four or three guys. I mean, not, Kiko can't be a three or four outside linebacker. Raekwon could, could probably do it because he's a physical player, but he's a better middle linebacker. And, and he's never done that before, by the way. And especially at the NFL level, I don't think you just, I don't think you want to do that to him. So it's the, how he, um, how he handles this defense, because he's got a really good secondary. His safeties are really good. Um, I think Bleacher Report named us. We had the best safety group in the in the NFL. And again, I I hate Bleacher Report. I think they're but I mean, give it take. Hey, um, we do have a good safety core uh, group. It's gonna be really interesting to see how it's all handled, uh, especially since Brian is a uh, defensive minded coach. And that's why he's gotten the job is because what he did with that. And he was a very aggressive uh, defensive coordinator in terms of being a play caller uh, for the Patriots last year. A lot of zero man, a lot of heat, especially on third down. Remember, they didn't have a they didn't have a proven um, pass rusher either last year. And with what they did, a lot of the times, how they got their pass rush, they did very creatively. It was a lot of blitzes. It was a lot of zero man. And it was a lot of Dante. They put Dante high high t- when they really needed to play, especially in the pat and in, in, in pass defense. They put Dante Hightower uh, at defensive end, um, and a lot of Patriots fans wanted him to just stay there. But they moved him around throughout the front. They did a lot of delayed stuff too. They would just spy Hightower, and he would you know anything short if it's a shallow cross or anything over the middle, and then he would just get sent late. It was a lot of creative stuff. It wasn't just, you know, hey, go rush the passer. None of it was. All of their sacks were very creative. So it's going to be very interesting to see. Does I, I'm assuming that's how it's going to be for the for the for for us, but do we have that Dante Hattower on the, on the team that can do that? Um, it's going to be interesting to see, man. Because uh, Charles Harris can't, and, you know, he can't be... Was that Raekwon McMillan? I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to see how he gets pass rush. But he was super creative last year with New England and how he generated it. Because, again, they didn't have a 
they didn't have Von Miller. You know, they couldn't just rush for and drop everybody back. It was all super creative. And Patrick Graham has come out and said that there's more ways than one to get to the quarterback. So I fully expect how they how they handled the deficiencies of a pass like a proven dominant pass rusher for that Patriots team last year. I feel like it's gonna be handled the same way here, even though Patrick Graham I think is going to be calling the plays, if I'm not mistaken. And I think the secondary, in terms of talent, is more talented than the Patriots. Now, everybody's going to freak out when I say that. They have a lot of versatile players in New England when you talk about Devin McCourty and Patrick Chung. And they have, you know, Harmon, who's a, who's a solid player. But really, I mean, they had Eric Rowe there. We have Eric Rowe now. And then we have X. X, to me, is just as good as Stephon Gilmore. Then you have Minka Fitzpatrick, who you can move throughout the entire defense. Rashad Jones, who's a very, very good ball hawk great instincts. TJ's a thumper. I think he has a lot of... Bobby McCain's a great slot. Um, you know, JC Jackson's probably the best slot that they have. Like, I feel like we have a better secondary than they do. I think it's... I don't want to say deeper. I just think the start... Like, there's just better caliber talent in terms of... at, at certain starting positions um, than in New England. Um, now, people are going to think that's crazy, but I feel like Minka... He's definitely going to be a better player than any safety... I think he's going to be a top three safety next year. Um, so, especially this is his second year. He had such a good rookie year. I'm very excited to see the, the leap he takes. So, not to get too far off track, speaking of the secondary, let's talk about the whole Rashad Jones situation. This next news story comes from Pro Football Rumors. Rashad Jones will report for minicamp. Um, so, I mean, obviously he will. Uh, let's see here. Safety Rashad Jones continued to stay away from the Dolphins. This comes from Pro Football Rumors again. To stay away from the Dolphins during the voluntary portion of their offseason program, but the team expects to have him for mandatory minicamp next month, per Barry Jackson of the Miami Herald. Jones had a falling out with the team last season, and it's been rumored that Miami plans on shopping him. Jones is due more than $13 million in guaranteed salary, so he isn't going to be released. Jones, a pro bowler as recently as 2017, is also coming off a shoulder injury. So, excuse me, shoulder surgery. But he has, obviously he will report from any camp. I don't think he's going to be traded, um, but first of all, Rashad Jones has, he's very much acted like Antonio Brown in terms of some of the antics that he pulled last year, benching himself. Like, that was ridiculous. Nobody that Nobody on that team was listening to Matt Burke, okay? No one was, clearly. Um... So, like, the stuff that he pulled last year, it's... I used to be a huge Rashad Jones fan, but you can't bench yourself. I don't care if you don't like the way you're being used or how much you're being used. Um, you cannot just sit down, like... And he didn't get punished for it, really. That was the stupidest part about it. Um, so, I maybe that's what the incident they're referring to, how he had a falling out with the Dolphin. First of all, none of those people are here. Unless you had an argument with Steven Ross... Or maybe Chris Greer. That's the only thing I could see being a problem. Or Chris Greer doesn't like Rashad because of what he did. I don't know. But maybe it all stems from that incident. Who the heck knows? But Odell Beckham, uh, Le'Veon Bell, they're all, you know, they never, none of them went to voluntary uh, minicamp. Um, I don't care that nobody went, or OTAs. Nobody went, I don't care. I do not care. Okay, as long as you're there when you're supposed to be there, I don't care. I don't think, first of all, nothing that happened um, in OTAs um, matters at all. It's when training camp comes around, and obviously mandatory mini camp. When that stuff comes around is when it matters. When preseason come around, comes around, that's when it matters. Um, nothing that's happened, this is really, I mean, it's a lot of just kicking off the rust. Um, you know, you can do some basic install stuff, which is the the thing that sucks because there is a new system being implemented that he wasn't there. Now, maybe someone gave him the playbook for him to be like, hey, here you go, dude. This is the basic install. You know, do what you, you know how to do drills. You've been doing it your entire life. Just figure it out. Um, because Rashad has been known to not listen and freelance throughout the defense. So, and that's what led to a lot of busted coverages. Um, so, especially when he played free safety. So, it's going to be an interesting relationship between him and Brian because this is a completely. This is someone who commands respect, who is attention to detail is everything, whose preparation means everything to him. Um, so he he can't do this, this the kind of stuff he did with Matt Burke, or he will be traded. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Like he's not going to be able to go out there and freelance 
he's got to, you know, obviously Rashad, you know, he's got to prepare. Um, he's got to take well to coaching. He again, this is what happens, man. When you're a veteran player and you get a big head like this, uh, you know, where you think you know it all and you know better than everybody else, it's going to be interesting to see how that relationship plays out. Uh, because he can't pull half the stuff he did last year. Now, maybe that had a lot to do with Matt Burke's coaching, and I'm not going to blame Rashad Jones for that because you know, clearly Matt Burke did not know what the heck he was doing. Um, so we'll see, man. That's going to be very interesting. I, f- I feel like if Rashad is traded, it has to do with the relationship with him and Brian. Um, because now that I'm thinking about it, the fact that he wasn't there, especially if it's a new playbook, I feel like, why not go meet the coach and the new, you know, the new D coordinator, the new DB's coach, and um, and grace yourself with th- those people and get to know. Like that, that's the part that's like, okay, any other year, I, I don't think it would have mattered. It, it has no effect, but this particular year, it definitely has more of an impact um, than not showing up if you've, you know, been. It was the same coaches after the last four or five years, or even, you know, this is year two. Then I'm, I'm totally fine with that, but. It is a little like, hey, this is a new system, you know, uh, new coaching staff. This is your first time really interacting with them. Maybe you want to be there, but especially since you're one of the better players on the team, I don't know. I, I, I really don't care either way. I don't think it's going to affect anything. He's got months and months and months to learn the playbook um, and get, you know, with the guys and the coaching staff. So I'm not I'm not worried about it. I, I feel like that whole thing is the, – the, the more interesting thing to me, the more interesting thing is – what is his like willingness and is he going to be able to be coached the way brian wants and how does that relationship because again he cannot pull the stuff he pulled last year okay you can't become lawrence timmons i know like a lot of vets came in there in that locker room and threw their weight around and got away with a lot of stuff you can't do that with this regime so we'll see how that 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 crapping plays out and i don't want to say the word crapping because it's a stupid word but i said it and we're going to move on now. I think, is that all the news? Yeah, well, I have this thing. It's called Most Intriguing Dolphins Camp Battles is Ryan Fitzpatrick versus Josh Hogan. No duh, dude. Um, but I had this interesting topic that I wanted to talk about. What? This comes from some site that I just deleted for some stupid reason, and I can't find it. But it basically... Uh, before we get into the fan tune, I, w- I wanted to discuss this. Um, what? And I can't find the site. <clears throat> what? Because jerseys are not—they're not cheap. Uh, jersey? Would you feel comfortably investing in in terms of buying? The the rule of thumb that I go by is, it has to be a great player. It has to be a player, and when I say great, I mean like really good, like Cameron Wake. Like Jason Taylor, he bleeds aqua and orange. You know what I'm saying? That's my rule of thumb. Um, the latest jersey that I actually have acquired, and I do not, dude. It's listen. It's been slim pickings over the last eight to ten years, really. Maybe even longer than that, to be honest with you. Because I had a Cam Wake jersey. Um, I still have, a, obviously, still have a Cam Wake jersey. Um, obviously, Dan Marino. Uh, you know the the great play. You know the, the Jason Taylors of the world. Like those are the good ones. Like those are the good ones that you could have, right? The 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 recent one that I have acquired and recently is Minka Fitzpatrick. I actually and that's a new player. And I actually after the first, I was like after the rookie, year, I was like, yeah, he's gonna be with us for a long time. He's at least gonna play out his rookie contract. He's a great player. I feel like he's super underrated. Um, he was the best player on the team last year, in my opinion. Uh, and I know a lot of people think X was, but I feel like what Minka was able to do his rookie year is super special. Um, he made so many big plays. He made a lot of underrated plays without a pass rush, a consistent one, and a terrible defensive coordinator and terrible coaching staff. He was a great, great player. Um, so that was the one that I recently ha- have done. Uh, but to me, dude, it, you can't just be some Joe Schmo walking off the street. In terms of bad ones that I have, the bad, the worst one really. Looking back on it, that I the, the, that I currently have, well, I have two actually. Reggie Bush. I don't know why the heck. Let's not even get into it. Moving on from that. Um, 
these are the two worst ones I have. Is Reggie Bush and I guess Ryan Tannehill you could put in that category just because he's a Titan now and will he really did he really leave his mark as a Dolphin? Is it more of a tragic story than it is a good one? I feel like it's more tragic than it is good. Just because of all the dysfunction he had to go through. Uh, he was a good player. He was, I, don't, I don't care what anybody says. He was a good player. Uh, um, but I feel like that one... So those are the two worst ones that I have. Um, I'm interested to see what your thoughts on. Who was the player that you would feel comfortable... And I, if I had, if I could, I, I would get an extra jersey for sure. I just... It's like... I don't need to. And, and Minka is... Um, it has nothing to do with X. Like I feel like X is a good one. Just to name some good ones. I just don't have X. X. Kenyon's a little interesting just because of his contract situation right now. Um, but I, re- to me, the ones that make the most sense... There's three, in my opinion. And I would not do... Josh Rosen, I think, is more of a hype thing. But in terms of if you don't have a lot of money and you have to and you and you want to buy a jersey, I feel like these are the three guys: Xavier Howard, um, Minka Fitzpatrick, and Laramie Tunsil. I think those are probably the three best players on the team right now. I think those are the three players that will be on the team the longest, and those are three great players. Um, you know, Xavier, an All-Pro player, first-team All-Pro player, one of the best cornerbacks in the league, if not the best. Uh, definitely top three. Minka Fitzpatrick, one of the best whatever position you want to put him in. He's a great player. He's going to be one of the best second DBs in the NFL for a long time. Laramie was the best left tackle last year. I think he only gave up one sack all year in the National Football League, by the way. That's very difficult to do. So it's not saying it's not like, oh, these are just the three players on a bad team. No, these are three very good players. So I think those are probably the players that you, you should probably buy in terms of jersey. So let's get into the fan Q&A, ladies and gentlemen. I thought that was an interesting... Not that Kenyon's not a great player. It's just that I don't think he might... There's a possibility, especially since we have such depth at the te- on the team, that he might not be on the team. So, I don't... I th- But again, and I think that's something we're going to talk about in the fan q because I think someone did ask that question. But I think he will be with the team. I think the, the organization has shown that they, are, they will pay, you know... This is something that Mike Tannenbaum didn't do. They will pay players that we have developed. And Chris Carr has come out and said, yes, we are building through the draft. That is the philosophy from here on out. Um, so that is going to be an emphasis on paying players that have developed. Uh, and I think Kenyon would be one of those guys. If I think he, this is a prove it year. If he does do it, I think he will be. And I don't think he'll leave Miami. I really don't. I don't think he's going to give us a hometown discount. But... I think if he performs well, then we are going to be willing to extend him, and I don't think he'll leave Miami if, if that opportunity uh, comes up. So I don't think Kenny's not like – I just don't – you never know. I think that's more up in the air than the other three. Uh, this uh, So let's get into the fan Q&A. Hopefully this wasn't a jumbled mess so far because I did go on tangents, and I'm trying to get better at that just to kind of really stay within – the thread of the conversation, or just the thread of what I'm talking about, really, and make my point. I'm trying to get better at that, um, and hopefully I continue to get better at it. I'm, I'm actively trying, but sometimes, man, you just kind of, I just kind of forget, and I apologize. So hopefully it's not such, because last episode I feel like I did that too much, um, and again, I'm doing it right now, because I just said get into the fan q and now I'm talking about this, so let's get into the fan q and <clears throat> This first question comes from, excuse me, Lewis right yeah traps he says what's up skags lewis traps here thanks for keeping us informed and i appreciate the football knowledge and insight you give every week big props to you true fans appreciate it that means a lot dude that means a lot you know i don't think before we go on i don't think people understand like that's awesome dude it, it gives it's like yeah this is why we're doing this the show and it just reinforces it and that's awesome dude uh, anybody who gives me a compliment you're a true homie and I really do appreciate that. That's 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 amazing. He says, side note, it's frustrating that we get associated compared to the Jets and, uh, and the Patriots. Although they are our rivals in the type of gossip sells, I wish we had our team, our own team identity. It seems like we're making moves toward that. Um, 
I hope we don't run slash crappy screen plays on third and long. Yeah, I hope so too. My question for you is, with a bunch of new coaches and players, potential offensive slash defensive weapons, what coaches will have the greatest impact improvement on their set players? I predict Chad O'Shea because of how fast our receiver unit is, talent potential, and his success with other mediocre receivers in the past. Your thoughts? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think he's going to have a huge impact on Mike too. Because uh, he he worked with Gronk as well, and because he he was the red zone offense coordinator, um, and obviously Gronk was, yeah, a very big part of the red zone offense. So I think he's gonna help Mike, and I th- I think he's gonna help Mike. I think he's gonna help the receivers, and I think you're gonna see. I don't know, because because if they stayed healthy, dude, um, I feel like that you know we wouldn't be talking. But I feel like they're all gonna take a big step forward. They're all going to fit this scheme perfectly. Again, like you stated, and like I, how I have stated um, throughout since we hired him, <clears throat> the talent level that he worked with in the past and how productive they were is ve- they were really bad. Like Chris, like that receiver core last year was not good. It was really bad, but they still performed well. They still were very, and he's developed a lot of good players as well. So I'm very excited to see what Chad does with this team. So I'd agree with you. I think I, I would say Chad, and then just to throw another one in there, just to not just to steal yours. Uh, I would say, I would say Pratchett Graham slash Brian Flores is going to do a fantastic job with this defense. I feel like the scheme we're going to implement is going to complement the secondary perfectly, and I feel like we're going to get a lot of sacks. And I feel like we're going to outsmart a lot of quarterbacks in our division as well. If we run the same scheme that we did last year, I feel like this defense is going to be pretty solid. Um, even though we don't have a proven edge guy, I feel like he is a very good defense. Just based off of what I watched last year and what I continue to watch, it gets me excited because his defense, and especially how they called plays, and, and Patrick and Brian were there for years. I feel like we're going to run that same type of, those same type of things. And the way that they both utilized particular players within that scheme it is, was beautiful. Uh, and New England has done that since Bill has gotten there, and they, you know, they don't spend big in free agency, but they just utilize what the certain players do well. I, you know, people like, oh, do your job, do your job, is the moniker there, and you know, this is what they say all the time, and all this other stuff. I think it has a lot to do with the coaching staff seeing a player and just either taking him in and out on whatever the situation is and whatever down it is, and putting him in and asking him to do what he does very well. And I feel like that's why they're so good every single year. It's because they know what they have, and they use that to the best of whatever the heck they do best, right? So not to just to throw another one in there, I feel like Brian Flores slash Patrick Graham will have a very positive impact on all of the young players on the defense. By the way, I've, well, I remembered to upload the, the, the questionnaire, or the fan q whatever the heck you want to call it. Earlier, and you guys came out hard. You guys asked 27 questions, which is a good amount. That's a lot, especially since how, how much I talk. So ho- hopefully we get to answer all of them. And that was a great question by Lewis as, as well. Uh, this next question comes from Bill. Uh, he says, um, Bill from Crazy California. I don't have a question. Thanks for making the off-season funner. I appreciate that, Bill, from Crazy California, which I would like to think is a fictional place. Because that, that's pretty hilarious, dude. Crazy California. And I appreciate that, dude. That means a lot. This next question comes from SM. He says, It's well known that the Patriots' former coaches have done, have not done well after leaving New England. And they always seem to reload coaches and players alike. Skag, speak about how losing many of their key coaches might have a major impact on New England in 2019. Um, the thing about this particular... These guys leaving New England, that is different than... Because I want to talk about that first before we move on. Because that was a criticism I had of hiring Brian Flores versus... Uh, what was his name? I don't know how I am. Uh, Richard, the defensive coordinator for the Seahawks and the Cowboys. Because he did, he's done a phenomenal... He's going to be a great head coach. He's one of the best defensive coordinators in the league. He has done a phenomenal job uh, with any unit he's coached. The, the, the argument that I had against Brian was, like, everybody who leaves New England... That coaches a different team sucks, and that's kind of stupid. Of that's kind of a dumb argument because all of them are different people, but that's all of them have the, that same thing in common is they were all started in New England, and their success had more to do with Bill than them. I think was the the argument that I had uh, against Brian 
the difference is Brian and everybody he's brought with him were there longer than anybody else who left New England to be a head coach. Longer than Mangini, longer than um, Bill O'Brien, and I think there's more that I'm forgetting. I just don't want to name them all. I mean, Vrabel is doing a good job right now at Tennessee. Um, my Patricia is completely just... He's actually... He was there longer than Matt was, uh, Brian. But Matt has just not done a great job with Detroit. Obviously, it was his first year there, but that team was better than what they played. But anyway, the point is... Um, I think the reason that they're different is because Brian was there longer. Um, and he's li- literally was there longer than anybody. I think any of them, really. Could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure. I'm right. Um, and Josh left to Denver and failed, but then he came back to New England. So I think collectively, I, I'm just saying, I think those guys have just been there longer. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. So maybe that that's a good... Because, you know, they're... You get my my point. I don't, I don't want to have to keep piling on that. Uh, so, Skag, speak about how losing many of their key coaches might have a major impact on New England. Um, I don't think that's going to have a major... Maybe because Chad is... You know, those are some big dudes. But I don't think that specifically will have an impact um, on the, the that particular team. If the Patriots do worse, it's because they can't run the ball on a consistent basis. Because I don't think Tom Brady can carry anything. I think he has to have a balanced attack. If he doesn't, then they're going to struggle. People forget, last year, dude, that running game was one of the best in the league. And no one could stop it last year, especially throughout the playoffs. And even in the Super Bowl, really, it, it was the defense that won them that game. It wasn't Tom Brady. I don't think Tom is the same Tom that he was, you know, maybe two years ago. Uh, obviously, when Tom, you know, isn't has, he doesn't have to pass it 50. Again, that's for any quarterback, really. And maybe that's really th- throughout his career. Well, not necessarily true, because against the Falcons, he passed a ton, and, and, and against the Seahawks as well. He was the reason they won that game. But I don't think he's the same. I think age, you know, father time is undefeated. Brett really, I mean, Brett had one good year, what was in 09, and then after that, it, it was not the same. Uh, and that was in his 40s. And I can't remember any other quarterback, really. I mean, Kurt Warner, I guess, but even then, it kind of started to fall off. So I think... Really, it's going to come down to, is the running game consistent? That's really what it's going to come down to. Um, Because I don't think, if Tom has asked you to carry that team, I don't, first of all, they're not, if if they make the puffs, they're not good, they're not getting out of either the first round. I don't think they're going to get a bye. Well, I guess if they win the debate. Well, anyway, I don't don't think, um, I I think it comes down to that. do the Patriots have a balanced attack? I think that's going to have more... I don't think the coaching staff thing is going to... Because Bill has been there through so much, dude. Um, and what I mean by that is when you talk about coordinators, like not other, you know... And again, they lost a lot of positional uh, staff as well. But I, I feel like Bill um, is Bill. He's a great head coach. Um I think, again, I think it's more going to be personnel than coaching staff. And how Tom Brady plays. And how, and again, if they give him a balanced attack or not. Because that receiver core is still bad. This next question comes from Upper Echelon. He says, rank our receivers uh, best to last according to your opinion. This is a great question. Um, man, dude, this is tough, dude. Um, I would say Albert Wilson is one. You know, when you go back out and you... You look at Albert Wilson, and the way I talk about him, when you go back and look, it's like, well, he, you know, the the games that he played in, you would think the way I talk about him, he had 100 yards in all of those games. If you look at the games that Albert was healthy in, first of all, if we didn't have Albert Wilson on the team, we wouldn't have went 3-0. and I think that's pretty clear. And we wouldn't have beat the Bears. That's clear. He single-handedly beat them. So he, was, he had a major impact on that team. But... He also was missed a lot. And same thing with Jakeem Grant. They both would have had more big... Like, the the thing that I think about the most is the deep pass Tannehill was used wide open. Tannehill missed him. There was another play that he missed him as well uh, in that particular game against the Jets. The play that uh, Tannehill overthrew... Like, he had Jakeem Grant for a touchdown twice in that game. Missed him both times. 
Like, there were plays that Albert and Jakeem were open that they just didn't get the ball. So, they could have even had even better games if it wasn't for some missed throws. So, I've, if I had to rank them, I would say Albert Wilson is the best. Um, two. Ooh. Especially in this scheme. I'm, I'm factoring that in, in, in scheme fit. Um, it's really between Jakeem right now and um, Kenny Stills. I'm going to say Kenny Stills because he's, he's a good route runner. He's just not very physical, uh, and that's a problem. But I would say to him, and he's not the greatest run after the catch guy. He's, he's more of just a deep threat, and he's a good route runner. And he's got pretty good, he's decent hands. Uh, ooh, that's a tough one, dude. In this scheme, Jakeem's probably a better player. I'm going to say Jakeem, too. I think he's going to have a better year. His run after the catch ability, the way that he, Chad can use him in, in a variety of different ways, I'm just going to say he's going to bring more to the table. Kenny, three. Um, and I'm going to say um, Devontae, four, just because he disappears and he's not consistent. But his talent level, he would be one. But we're not basing this off of talent. Um, so yeah, the, the, if I had to rank him, that's how I would rank him up, Rashlon. This next question comes from AB the Kid. He says, your thoughts on the Rosen Aaron Rodgers comparison? Hashtag fins up. I heard this, I think Trent Dilfer compared the, the, the two to each other. I think it's the dumbest comparison. And he didn't, because obviously their playing styles are different. Aaron's a better athlete than Josh. Um, even though Josh has good pocket presence. Like he moved, the way he moves in the pocket. Um, and he's, he's, he's a good athlete, Josh. He's like Troy Aikman-level athlete. He's not Aaron Rodgers-level athlete. Um, but the, he, the reason he compared the two, this is where it gets really stupid. The reason he compared the two is their personalities are the same. And I'm like, what? Don't say that. Because none, none of Aaron Rodgers' teammates like him. So... That's where it gets weird, because um, I mean, unless all like Greg Jennings, Donald Driver, Charles Woodson, um, you know, some of the things that we heard, obviously the coaching staff, some of those things, like the relationship wasn't great. Even though Mike McCarthy might not have been the best head coach, and just what other players have said about Aaron Rodgers, I don't think that's necessarily the best thing. Now, if it was like a Peyton Manning, uh, then yeah. But everything that we've heard is Aaron is very distant from the team. Like he's not very relatable. I'm not going to say he's a bad person, and people don't like being around him, but it's not the fact that he's not very relatable. He's not one of the guys. So I don't necessarily think that's a great, a good thing because the reason Aaron Rodgers gets away with that is because he's a great he's a great quarterback, and, and Josh has not proven that yet. So I don't think that's a good thing. I don't understand why Trent Dilfer thought that was a good thing because it's not. It's not. The reason people listen to Aaron Rodgers isn't because of his demanding personality. It's because of the things that he does on the football field are so special. It has nothing to do with his personality. He's not Baker Mayfield. He's not Brett Favre. He's not Peyton Manning in that way. He's not Tom Brady. He's not one of the guys. He can't, you know, if it wasn't for his play on the field, and I'm going to repeat myself, then he would not get away with that. And I don't think that's a good comparison because if Josh Rosen has that personality but doesn't back it up, then that leads to Jay Cutler, toxic locker room, Right? And he's never going to see the field, if that's the case. But So I thought that was a terrible comparison, dude. It's a terrible comparison. Do I think Josh is that way? I don't think he's the most... Um, I don't think... I think he's a very good teammate. Because Christian Kirk... Everybody in Arizona like stuck, stood up for him. And it was like, he's a great guy. He's a great teammate. And even Steve Wilkes, who has no dog in the race, came out and said he was a great leader. He was, he had none of that off the field stuff and personality stuff was a factor. So I don't think that is how Josh is. I think he is a good team guy. I just don't think his personality is that one of like a Baker Mayfield. You know what I mean? He's a very like his interests lot. Like he's not. You can tell that he he came from a place of wealth. You know what I mean? But that doesn't mean he's not the, the the players don't like him and he's not a good leader. I just don't think he's one of the guys necessarily, if that makes any sense. 
I think that's true for a lot of the quarterbacks in the league now. Like, Andrew Luck, like, he's a goofy dude. Like, he's not the most relatable dude in the world. Russell Wilson's the same way. They're just great people, and, and they're great teammates. And I think both can be the same. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to be the most relatable dude to be someone that, you you know, that is a good leader and you want to play for and play with. If you're a cocky, arrogant, uh, throw-your-weight-around type of a guy... Um, and, and you don't play, you don't back it up on the field, then you're not going to last long. You know what I'm saying? And if you don't spend time with the, 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 the your teammates and don't make an effort for, with your teammates, then you're not going to last long, especially if you're not a good player. And that was the Jay Cutler problem. It's like, why does people keep giving it? Like, so both can be the same the same thing. You can be a great teammate but not be like have the same interests, if that makes sense. And I think that's a, true for a lot of the quarterbacks in the league. Um, but I, you know... I don't know what I'm really trying to say right now, but I think you guys understand the gist of it. Um, so yeah, let's move on. Uh, this next question comes from Upper Echelon. He says, remember that I told you Nick Needham will surprise people. I don't know what the heck that means, Upper Echelon. I'm being honest with you. Uh, maybe someone could tell me that. Maybe I'm just an idiot. I think I'm an idiot. Remember that I told you Nick Needham will surprise. So he hasn't surprised yet. We'll see, man. Uh, this next question comes from Ron. He says, "If we run uh, the same offense that the Patriots are running, with the, uh, what roles will Grant and Wilson play in that offense? Our receiver core is more dynamic and prone to big plays than the Patriots." You're absolutely correct on that, Ron. What role? So, like, I ooh, um, Jakeem Grant will be the Cordell Patterson of this team he will be the deep threat he will be the guy that we hand the ball off to in the backfield he will be that dude and albert wilson will be too but i feel like albert wilson will also have that edelman role if that makes any sense he's a physical slot receiver who can take who can you know take the physical nature of that position he's a good route runner he's also got great speed and he can also do and they do stuff with edelman as well especially when edelman was younger they did a lot of trick plays with him so i think he'll be the edelman i think Jakeem will be the Cordell Patterson. If this is listen, I'm really counting on the fact that you watched the Patriots last year, and you understand what I'm saying. And then what will DP be? He will be the Josh Gordon. Um, and you know he'll be the Randy Moss type of kind kind of a guy who's the physical outside guy that we you know, especially in the red zone. But he's not going to be that. You know what I mean? If that makes any sense. But I feel like that's what they'll ask him to do in that offense. If that makes any sense. Um, and as for everyone else, um, who else am I missing? Kenny Stills? Um, who, who could I compare him to who's a past? I don't want to say Philip Dorsett because I feel like he's a, he's a way better player. Dion Branch would be a good one. Oh, man. I was going to say Jabbar Gaffney, but I don't think anybody's going to get what the heck I'm saying. Um... Kenny's interesting because I don't think he he matches up with anybody else New England really add because he's such a he's so he's so fast and a deep threat but at the same time you know I feel like who was that for New England you know Phil Dorsett but he's a better player he can do he's more versatile same thing with like Jabbar Gaffney um, Trent Brown I don't know I feel like Kenny's just a white he's different. I feel like Kenny is going to be asked to a lot. I think he's going to play more like the outside role, uh, but like a two. You know what I mean? Like like a Reggie Wayne, the Marvin Harrison type of a thing. Um, so that I think that's where Kenny kind of falls in. Uh, this next question comes from SM. He says, looking at the schedule, how do we not start 0-3? Oh, now, this is an interesting question. And when I saw this pop up, I was like, dude, let me go ahead and check the Dolphin schedule. So I think this is a great question. Not to dive into the entire thing, but just talking about the um, first three games. They're pretty tough. Like, like week one against the um, Ravens. Now, let me, I'm going to look at the schedule real quick to make sure. I don't want to know who's home and who's not. Um, are we home for that game? Yeah, so we're home. I think the first two games were at home, right? Yeah, we're the, the first two games of the year that we're at home. Um...
and then we go on the road to the Cowboys for the third. How do we not start 0 and 3? Here's how we don't do that. We have a, we really throughout Dolphins history have gotten off to good starts, especially in September. Recently, if you look at it, 2013 we did, right? Uh, in 20, what was it? We always really do, uh, especially in week one. Like, you think about some of the week one victories that we've had. When's the last time we lost in week one? Uh, was it against the Texans in 2012? Because what, in 2013, we, um, who did we beat in week one? Because I know we won week one. Um, you know, we, we had that one week one when against New England. I think that was in 2014. This recent past, you know, the Redskins we beat in week one. Um, I don't know what year that was. I think maybe that had been 2015. In 2016, I don't think... That was the first time we lost in week one, right? In a long time. We started, what, 0-3 that year? But we still made the playoffs. I can't remember who we lost to, though, if we did in week one. Maybe we started 1-4. I don't think we started 0-3. But usually we have a good start to the year. Um... We have great home field advantage. In the heat, that's a factor. And anytime we beat Baltimore, it's usually at home, and especially anytime it's a close game. We have a better coaching staff, too, as well. I don't want to stay too long on this because I could, and we're, getting, we're running out of time. So, really, my thing is, is history, really. Uh, is how we don't start 0 and 3, and I feel like Brian Flores, especially against the Ravens, they're very one dimensional. They're just they have a really good running game, um, so we'll see how he prepares for that particular team. But I, f- I feel like just home field is how we don't start 0 and 3, and we always play New New England great at home. So those are the first two games of the year. Then we go on the road against Dallas, so we can start 2 and 1. Um. This next question comes from SM. He says, thought on Adam Gase taking over the Jets' GM position. Is this man crazy enough to ravage that team's talented players the way that he did in Miami if he didn't get along with them? Or has he been humbled by his experience in Miami? First of all, I love how everybody is talking about how Buffalo and New York have these great rosters. They don't. Like how this offense is going to be improved in Buffalo. The biggest, what, the biggest offseason signing they had on offense Um. Well, they had what they had Frank Gore and Cole Beasley. Like, what the heck, they what what are where are they gonna get consistent? And John Brown, like, what are, what are you guys talking about? They don't have a number one receiver. Neither do the Jets. Okay, the receiver court they have Jamison Crowder, who's a slot, right? They have Le'Veon Bell. Their offensive line they get signed Clutchio Simile, but their tackles still aren't one of the, some of the best in the league. Same thing with Buffalo, right? I can't, I can't, I would have to look at every signing that they had. Like, it's not like these guys, th- their rosters are greatly improved. Like, they have these high powered offenses. Um, I'm sick and tired of people saying that. But, yeah, so the thing that I take away most from that whole Jets and Adam Gase situation is drama seems to follow Adam Gase wherever he goes. I'm not, I don't have to list every, the cocaine, the Lawrence Timmons. You know, uh, you know some of the relationships Adam Gase had within the building. The players, and some of the relationships he had with the players weren't very good. Like, drama seems to follow Adam Gase wherever he goes. And that's obviously not a good thing. Has he been humbled by his experience? No, I still feel like he's the same guy. And he's going to do things his way. This next question comes from Ron. He says, do you think the Dolphins had a mis- uh, made a mistake not taking a top defensive end prospect in the draft? This always kills me. Um, I guess you could make an argument that they could have done it in the second round by trading up. Um, but you talk about a top guy. There was really, I mean, I guess you could have taken Montez Sweat. Uh, but the best player available was Christian Wilkins. So, no, I don't think they made a mistake. Douglas, this question comes from Douglas Ward. He says, hey, Skaggs, Kenny Drake is heading into a contract year and could demand a substantial pay increase next year. If Caleb Balazs can do the same job with three years to go on his contract, could uh, it could behoove to move us? It could behoove us to move Drake now uh, when his value is still high. What could Drake get us in a trade compensation? And do you think Balazs can be just um, as good? What are your thoughts? Ken- Kenyon is not going to get us nothing. The running back market is terrible. 
the fact that you know I, you know Le'Veon didn't get a ton of cash can when you talk when you compare it to other positions right the running back market as a whole is not great I still feel like we can keep Kenyon and I feel like what you're gonna get with Ken, I don't know a fourth to fifth round pick is probably the best you're gonna get really just because the running back market's not great and they're not valued that much the best Kenyon can do is just stay here in my opinion and I feel like he's still gonna be productive so I don't think I think just keeping Kenyon is probably the best move uh, just because I don't think you're gonna get a lot for him uh, the next question comes from Ron. He says, can we talk about anything Dolphins without the quarterback position? I honestly am getting sick and tired of Rosen, this and that. I think we did a good job of that this this episode. JFG says, do you think we will run more of a 4-3 th- or a 3-4? Like a 3-4 or a, a lot better? I like 3-4 a lot better, is what he said. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of crazy stuff, dude, if I had to be honest. I think you're going to see a lot of nickel. I think you're going to see more nickel than you would, or dime, for sure, than you would 4-3. Which, that with all that, just means is there's just an extra DB on the field. Um, like, in a 4-3, you would have three linebackers, you would have two outside corners, and then you would have four down linemen, right? Um, in, a, in a nickel, you just have an extra corner out there. Like, say it's a nickel or a dollar package, you would just have three down linemen. And if it's a dollar, you would have two DBs. Um. So yeah, that's just the difference. I think you'll see more of those than you would see a four three. Uh, upper echelon, just based off of what New England did. I know the personnel's not the same, but I I still think that'll reign true. Upper echelon says, how many linebackers will we carry, and who will they be? I have no idea who they'll be, but you're gonna see a lot of linebackers. Ron says, I think our linebacker core is better than it's ever been since Miami got its franchise. Do you agree? Jerome Baker, Chase Allen, Raekwon McMillan, then you bring in Terrell Hankins, Michael Smith, Trey Watson, and including hybrid guys like Andrew Van Winkle, or have you say his name, Tyron Holmes, Jerron Elliott, and Nate Orchard. is insane to me. Are all young and extremely underrated? Do you agree? I think they're all diff. They can do a lot of things differently, and I think the the rotation and the depth is probably the best it's been in a, in, in 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 a, in a while. But there's still a lot of unproven guys there. So no, I definitely do not think it's not even close. I don't think it's one of the best linebacker cores we've ever had. I don't think that's even um, a debate. I think the best we had probably would. I mean, the killer bees were really good, um, and I know that also wasn't linebackers, but Nick Bonacani and um, you know, he was a Hall of Fame linebacker. So him alone, I feel like, you know, obviously in the 70s, um, recently, I mean, Zach Thomas, um, he's had some good running mates throughout his career. We think, you know, Joey Porter and him. Wait, Zach was with Joey, right? Maybe not. I don't think he was. No, I don't think he was. Um, I could be wrong about that. But no, I don't think it is. I don't even think it's close, to be honest with you. Uh, B. Dennis says, Could you see us making any more trades before the, dead- the deadline? And which pin... Pen- I said pin. I'm losing my mind. Could you? Would you expect to be on the block if so? Rashad Jones. That would be the only one I could think of. Um, JFG says, I heard that Leonard Williams is on the trade box. Should we trade for him? Uh... He's a D lineman. I feel like the DT position is pretty good. I think we have Christian Wilkins, uh, Vince Taylor, Devon Godshaw. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting someone. Uh, the Brazilian guy that we have who could be our nose tackle. JFG says, do you think we, there will be some surprise cuts after the preseason? If so, who do you think they will be? Surprise cuts? No. And I, I really couldn't see anyone getting cut that would be a surprise. Um, I couldn't see anybody. I think Charles Harris would be the biggest one. If that, if there was like some surprise one, it would be Charles Harris. Uh, take me out. Says, what do you think the rotation on the defensive line would look like based on the current roster? I have zero clue, dude. Especially with D ends, like there's not a ton of depth there, and like that, I don't know. That's interesting. We, we, we have to keep going a little bit for me to, to say. 
uh, J. Cray, he says, why are we being ranked last in the NFL when we exceed expectations just last year? Aren't we better on paper than we just... Dude, we've been ranked last in the NFL. In 2016, we were. Uh, this past year, last year, we were. Like, we were predicted to win one game in all of those years. Uh, that is going to be it, guys. I'm sorry we couldn't get all the questions in, but that is it for this week. I appreciate all the nice comments. Everybody who I didn't get to, I appreciate you as well. Um, a lot of interesting topics. I can't wait to see what you guys say down in the comment section below. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I am Skaxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxxx